My name is Audrey Houlihan and I'm the CEO here at the hospice. It gives me great pleasure to welcome colleagues, volunteers, panellists and supporters to this evening, um, which is our third discussion under our Dignity and Death Living in Life series. It's fast become an important event in our diaries and indeed it's one of my favourites um, in recent years. And as some of you will know, um, this year is a very special year for the hospice as we celebrate 140 years of caring for the community. It's also a very special week as it's Palliative Care Week and we look forward to our coffee morning next week. So a very busy one around the place. We've grown significantly since the hospice was established those 140 years ago by the Religious Sisters of Charity. And today we're a 200 bedded hospice with over 600 staff and 330 incredible volunteers. We work across two sites, Harold's Cross and Blackrock, soon to be three as we look forward to opening in Wicklow. And on to this evening, which I'm sure you're looking forward to, and I hope that you really enjoy another thought provoking event. We're delighted to have such a distinguished panel to give their time to talk to us this evening. And I'd particularly like to welcome and thank Marion Finucan, who has given her time to talk to us this evening and moderate the event after what's been a very long day. So we're truly grateful that she's come to welcome. us. Welcome. The topic of this year's conversation is the Irish way of dying. And we're aiming to openly address the asp all aspects of dying, death and our attitudes to mortality in Ireland. As an organisation, we feel that it's an important topic and we all hold an interest uh, but sometimes avoid. So we're looking forward to this evening to explore it further. Just before I hand over to Marion, I have just a couple of formalities. Um, for everyone's enjoyment, if we could silence or turn off your mobile phones so it doesn't disrupt any aspect of the evening. Um, in the unlikely event that we have to evacuate, you can see the exits behind me here. I'll do a little bit of my air hostessing now. Okay. Um, and please make sure that you give assistance to anyone that needs help in your area. I'd also like to mention uh, it's time to take the lippy and the combs out. Uh, we're being photographed and there's audio recording of the evening. We were booked out today and there's a lot of people um, due to Ursula's kind note on the radio this morning wanted to come. So in their interest, we're going to record the evening. And now to the main event, I'll ask Marion to kindly take over. I hope you enjoy. OK, thank you very much. Uh, just briefly, I've had kind of a long-ish association with different aspects of hospice, including having relations who benefited from hospice um, when they were dying. Uh, but the first time I came to Harold's Cross, I was a baby. Um, I was going to say producer, no, it was an interviewer. And I was sent out to do an item on the hospice. And I arrived outside in, in a much smaller campus. Than, well, the campus was big, but there weren't all the buildings. And I sat outside and I thought, how in the name of God am I going to do this? Like go in, talk to people who are dying and ask them how they feel about dying. And like I composed myself and got my face all serious and empathetic and that. And I arrived, came in the door and the first thing I heard was laughter. And I was utterly shocked and I thought, how terribly disrespectful. <laughs> anyway, by the time I left, uh, my head had been changed forever. Um, and there had been laughs along the way. There had been very sad things, but there had been laughs along the way too. So I've, I'm an enormous respecter of uh, hospice, and I'd like to say that so you know I'm completely biased, okay? <laughs> now, if I could introduce you to our guests for this evening, uh, we've Dr. Ursula Bates, some, some of you might have heard uh, on the radio this morning, Principal C Clinical Psychologist with Our Ladies Hospice and Care Services, uh, Dr. Stephen Higgins, Consultant in Palliative Medicine and Medical Director here, Mary O'Rourke, former Minister for Education, Health and Public Enterprise, who's here not so much in a political capacity, but in the sense of giving witness to her own experience uh, at the loss of her husband. 
We have a uh, funding partner, Robert Maguire, uh, who's the director of Massey Brothers, uh, funeral directors. Um, I'm sure none of us want to be ringing anytime <laughs> soon, but we will, all of us, like it or not, uh, one of these days, uh, but not too soon, Lord. And <laughs> Venetia Quick, who, like uh, Mary, uh, she is co-presenter of Dublin's Q102 um, and a co-presenter of Grief Encounters, a podcast. And um, she speaks also out of her own personal experience of losing her husband, Martin. Now, normally speaking, if I were in, in this radio studio, I would start with the personal accounts. But I thought today that I wouldn't and that I would start with Stephen because we had a chat outside, a really tiny one, about those very things. How am I going to talk to them? How much do they know? Should we tell somebody the condition they're in? What will I do if I cry? All those the serious things when you really want to say, oh, you'll be grand. Is that a question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. OK. I thought you'd start with something a little easier. <laughs> I think communication, so I've worked in the hospice quite a long time now. And the bit that I enjoy the most, and, and the reason I'm here really, is the communication. It's those conversations that you get to have. And I think I'm a big, like yourself, I'm very biased towards the hospice, towards palliative care. I believe in what we do. And I think the most important thing we do is communicate with people really well in a situation where sometimes that doesn't happen and the very obvious, simple things get, get missed. Get See, overlooked. people might be afraid to frighten daddy or frighten mammy, yeah. you know, and, you know, they don't. And I presume some people don't want to know. Absolutely. I mean, there are people who, well, I think there's very few people who don't know, who really don't know how sick they are. They're a very small group. But you have a bigger group than that who do know but don't want to talk about it. But even that group, it's still a minority. And you have the large majority who do want to know. They mightn't like the news. They mightn't be happy about it at all. But they want to know. They want to be involved in what's going on. Do they really? Most people do. These are big decisions that are being made. Surely. You know, what treatment am I going to have? Where am I going to be? How long have I got to live? Most people long, want to know how those long things. How long have I got to live? Is that a very common one? Yes, it is. And do families disagree? You know, that the sisters say, leaving the man alone, he doesn't need to know, but the brothers say he's a grown man. All the time, and for the very best of reasons. So you can have these sort of strange situations where the, the patient in the bed perhaps knows full well what's going on. The, the daughter or the son or the mother or the, knows full well, but they're not telling each other because neither wants to upset the other. And, and sometimes our role is perhaps to be the middleman and just sort of say, well, actually, Mary, you know, how do you feel you're doing? How do you think are, things are going? And to ask them that question in front of the family such that they can begin to talk about it. Mm. And those conversations, they're not easy conversations, but they can be so therapeutic. Yeah. And, and the, For the patient? Oh, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Really? And, and I suppose what we do in the hospice very often, we're having those conversations and, and they're they can be very difficult conversations and in the moment they can be very painful for the family and the patient but for the vast majority it's a relief mm -hmm. and it's maybe just confirming what they know giving them back a little bit more response not responsibility but knowledge of what's yeah. going on because that 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 the lack of knowledge can yeah. be very very scary I yeah think. and i presume that the patient doesn't want to upset the family by yes. saying, for God's sake, you know, it's don't be telling me lies. It's the very same thing. Yeah. So you, yeah. you might be outside the door and you're talking to, let's say it's the daughter who says, you mustn't tell dad. And then you go in and dad says, no, don't tell my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a delicate yeah. negotiation. But it's all kindness and love, really, oh, isn't it? absolutely it is. Uh, it's a tricky one. And there's sometimes there can be misunderstanding, Ursula. And I will come to you on, on this one. Um, it's, a, it's a big decision to say, I don't want my friend, parent, whatever, uh, to have any more treatment. I want palliative care. Where doctors have been trained, and happily so, uh, to keep you alive and healthy. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the really critical thing there is healthy. Um, how, how do you work around that? Because it's a big ethical question. 
Um, well, my own background is psychology, so I, I'm rarely at that cutting edge. That's often more our colleagues in the general hospitals are having that big conversation about moving out from under active care to maybe more supportive care. And I think when we work with our colleagues, our, we're very keen that people have those conversations, even though they're, again, as Stephen said, they're difficult conversations to have. So I think we're, this is why we have even these events, because the, the more we talk about this, the more this becomes an open conversation, the easier it is for all of us, for the consultants in the general hospitals ourselves to relate around this topic. You right. Know. I, I, I was privileged enough to, to chair something in St. James's yeah. during that whole uh, hospice friendly hospitals yes, uh, movement. Yes. Yeah. And I, I never forget the, the, the levels, you know, pecking order uh, that came. I think there was one consultant. Uh, there were a group of very shy care workers, you know, who would do the cleaning and bring around. Uh, there were a lot of nurses, and then, but the doctors didn't want to know. Is that the way it is? I, th I don't know. I th maybe Stephen could respond to that. There's a, a nice, more. easy <laughs> question for you. He knows his colleagues better. <laughs> yeah. This evening is not going well. <laughs> I, I think medics are probably towards the back of the queue. Yeah. You know, um, we're all about what can be done. That, that's our training is all about doing everything that can be done. Yeah. And up to a, to a very advanced point, that's the right thing. But then there's a point where actually what you, it's about what should be done. Mm. And I think going from what can be done to what should be done mm -hmm. is a subtlety that a lot of people aren't comfortable with. Yeah. 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 Um, Have any of you had conversations mm -hmm. with members of your family to say, like, if this happens to me or that happens to me, I want you to save my life to the end, or I don't want to go for treatment, or I do not resuscitate, you know that term. Or if you'd had a, I don't know, catastrophic stroke, whatever. Have any of you had conversations among your families? I've had. Uh, who hasn't? Yeah. I rest yeah. my case. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, can I come to uh, you, Mary, now? And you very public about the, your heartbreak when you mm. lost your husband, Enda, but you, you didn't stay quiet about it. No, because I got huge relief from talking about it. You see, similar to your lead-in, there was no time Enda got a brain bleed one night and died the next day in the matter. So there was, from about 10 o'clock that night, he was no longer conscious. So I, I had not, I wasn't able to navigate, you're going to die and how do you feel about it? That didn't happen. So with the result that then when he died and got buried, it was also very quick. And that I felt then, I want to talk about it. And that when I talked about it, publicly or privately, it relieved me greatly, hugely, because I was able to go through the last journey I had with him, which was from Athlone to Dublin with a friend of ours driving the car and another friend of his beside him. And I was in the back seat with Ender who was slipping into unconsciousness as we drove. I always think of Kinnegad because at Kinnegad, to me, he died. He didn't actually die until the next day, but he stopped talking. And up to that, he was able to have just, you know, where are we going? You're going to the matter and there. He loved the matter. I don't know why, he just <laughs> loved it because he had been there for something a couple of years before that and they were lovely to him. And he said, because the doctor, the local doctor, when he came, said to him, we'll get to me, we'll get him to poor to uncle. And he said, no, real loud voice, no, I'm going to the matter. <laughs> so um, he was giving odd remarks to me. And I had my arm around him in the back seat. And he put his head on my breast. And I've always been happy that his last conscious thought must have been, I'm with Mary and I'm going to be all right. right. So I haven't had been able to have meaningful conversations. So after what you asked me directly, so yes, I, I, did, I thought by me talking about it, 
it would make it less awful for people to contemplate because I think sometimes a sudden death, well, nearly sudden, quasi-sudden, is helpful and harmful at the same time. It's helpful in that it has happened and there's no long lead in, but it sure packs a punch afterwards. It's very hard to reconcile your head with it, what has happened to right. your nearest right. and dearest. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to leave you to last, Venetia, um, to go through the story of, of what you do and what you did and, and your experience. But I mean, I was joking, Robert, um, when I was saying people don't really want to be ringing you, and the truth is they don't. Yeah. So how do, how, how do people navigate that? And how do you deal with them and are they all different or are they all just shell-shocked and in the same position? Well no, I, I truly believe that every family are completely different and any, every individual is different and whether that conversation has happened before the event has taken place or not, the time when it does happen is a very emotional time. So again, we're not necessarily thinking all that straight. So for me it is very important to try and have some discussions whether that's even today or tomorrow, a long time away from your demise, that you're in great clarity and that you know that maybe even the simplest things is, well, do I want to be cremated? Do I want to be buried? Those decisions can cause great confusion come the time if you've never discussed them before. Or do I want to have a religious service? Do I want to have a non-religious service? And again, that can cause great confusion um, at a time where you're not thinking 100% straight because you're trying to deal with all the emotions that you maybe not necessarily have done before, you know, so. I heard somebody recommending uh, within the last year, um, and, and I mean, I can, I can feel myself going for an intake of breath, that you would discuss with your husband or your wife or whatever, how, how you would like all of that to happen, down to like the music that might be played at your funeral and I thought, ah, here now, that's, that's going a step too far, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's not, and I, I truly believe it's not. Like, at the moment, Marion, in this country, there are over 60,000 people suffering with dementia at the moment. So 60,000 people out there today will not be able to express their wants or their wishes clearly when that time arises. So, um, again, why not do that now when you're in the full of your health? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a very morbid conversation. It just has to be, as I said, around the dinner table, you can have a bit of, maybe a bit of fun around that discussion now when you're all in, the, in, in, in great health. And um, it's just those little bits of information that can make a huge impact come the time when you are meeting me. And, and say, just off the top of your head, what proportion of people would have had those conversations before a well, death? At the moment in the country, we, we're running at about 5% of people have already made their arrangements. So there are, op there are options out there where people have made their full funeral arrangements and they might have even paid for them today. So whether that be through an insurance-based plan or a, a plan where you can pay today, you know. And um, again, it's just putting their wishes down on paper. like. It is something all of us, no matter what, are going to experience. Have you done it? I haven't, but I've had... <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had some very interesting discussions with my wife at home. And again, she would be very uh, familiar with my wants and wishes yeah, come the time. So, right. uh, but again, my wife's an embalmer, so uh, those discussions <laughs> are quite easy to have, you know? So uh, I'm not like everybody else, you know? Yeah. But, I always say, Marion, every single day there is someone yeah. having a terrible day. And we all have witnessed that. We all know that. Mm -hmm. And again, I just, I can't understand why. We, we have all gone to many funerals. We've all gone to many sad funerals, unexpected funerals. But you see, funerals. we pat ourselves on the back and we say, we're great at yeah. death and dying and we'll tell great stories about the person and there will be song and there will be laughter and, and, and all of that. But I often think the person that gets left out is the dead person. Mm. Oh, Do you know? Yeah, yeah. Like it's easy for the rest of us to sing well, actually, songs. Actually, that's very interesting. I was thinking about that. Do you mind me coming in like Not this? Not at all. As you, as you both were talking.
because I'm the age I am now and I've two grown up sons and I've already told them one of the songs I want in the church. What is it? The parting glass. Oh lovely. Yeah, yeah. I want I want people to remember me not with a glass but in good humour. Yeah. And and they've said to me from time to time, do you still mean that, the parting glass? And I say, yes. <laughs> so now, if any of you come to my funeral, <laughs> make sure it's you'll be treated to that. <laughs> <laughs> Not to the parting glass, but to the music. <laughs> yeah. Um, Venetia, tell us your own story. Um, well, my husband, Martin, um, passed away 18 months ago. He... Uh. Um, was diagnosed with uh, stage four uh, lung cancer. Mm. Um, was given 10% chance of five years. He died very suddenly at home um, after five months. So as Mary was saying, it was the, it was the bombshell, the yes, after yeah. where he just, I literally left the house with my youngest son, I have three sons, and the other two were at home with him. He was totally fine had done, um, bought a load of kids to a party the day before, uh, was coming to pick myself and my younger son up from somewhere and we'd left about 15 minutes and um, started getting, um, the ambulance actually in the fire brigade passed us as we were oh, going up. Yeah. And um, we suddenly get, started getting phone calls to say, come back. And This was from your sons? Uh, this was from my eldest son who was 12 at the time and um, the paramedics who he'd rung the paramedics while Martin was still conscious. Martin had said, ring, the, ring an ambulance. All right. Because he was starting to have a heart attack. And then, um, so my son rang them and um, then he collapsed and then the paramedics were there. And after he got the diagnosis, mm. um, which must have been a fair flipping shock for, for yeah. one and all. It's like that movie scene that you watch and you don't really, think you're ever going to be yeah. in and then you are mm. and then it's sort of like yeah. you don't really take it in. And did you have conversations and did you have them with the kids? Well because it happened so quick with our with, with the kids with the our eldest son had just started secondary so we sort of gave him a chance to settle in and then we sort of said to him what was going on and um, we didn't really get a chance with the two little ones because it was uh, they were five and seven at the time and it was also because it sort of was going to we wanted to get through the treatment first and see how we went um, but ironically uh, the night before Martin died we did have a conversation <laughs> about just we were at home we was watching Winning Streak we were just having like a, a bit of a fun night at home and um, we had um, we were chatting about what would happen if it was five years and you know that sort of thing and he was very adamant he wanted to be at home and he was sort of laughing but where would we put the bed and where would we you know so it was sort of it was quite light-hearted um and but he was very adamant that he wanted to be at home and then ironically the next he day was. he went yeah um very suddenly but i was very sure what he'd want at his funeral so that was i was under no yeah. I knew exactly what he wanted. And how did he cope with a diagnosis, even of five years? Because I know we're all on the one road, mm. um, but we kind of, it's kind of like the last taboo. We just put it out of the mind because we, we just don't want to think about it. Yeah. But to get a, a five year diagnosis is kind of like a death sentence. Well, yeah, it was. I mean, they said that, I mean, he was 49. So they um, said to him that it was, they could manage it and they could treat it, but they couldn't cure it. Yeah. Um, and then they said, don't go on Google, which is, of course, the first thing <laughs> yeah. you do do. And then when you look up stage four cancer and Google lung cancer, it gives you a, a much shorter diagnosis than five years. Um, he was actually very good about it. Um, I think I just went into work mode and keeping going, which now looking back, I sort of regret. Had I known that that could happen, I would have taken maybe a bit more time off work. We would have done more. Um, we sort of, um, he, but he was, he was very positive. He, was, he would have been a positive person anyway. So he was quite, 
you know, going, I, you know, I'll get this and sure, I'll be grand. And actually the night before he died as well, we sort of, we'd had a conversation with a, a specialist in the States who was a friend of the family and he sort of had said, look, it's as good as it gets. So that's why I think we'd started, that had kick-started the conversation. Um, so I actually said to him, you know, maybe this is the time to take the big holiday, take the kids out of school, do the big holiday, we borrow off the insurance money and uh, Martin, <laughs> Martin Tidbread right, said, but there's only one problem, what if I don't die? <laughs> and then, so it was sort of, you know, yeah. that's the gallows humour, that's yeah. what he was, you know, yeah. Yeah. going into it with, so, you know. And afterwards, in mm. terms of bereavement, yeah, uh, because it's a big question about children and you get people saying, oh, don't let them near the graveyard or don't let yeah. them near this, they'd be too upset. Mm. And there's another school of thought that says not so, not so, yeah. keep them informed, keep mm. them involved. H how did you handle all that? Well, looking back, just with relation to telling them, I, th I, I do wish we told our two younger sons. I, I wish we'd sort of, because I don't think then it may have been such a, a shock for them. Yeah. Um, but really we didn't get that chance, so it wasn't. Um, yeah. I think when Martin's parents both died, I was very sort of like, do they really need to go to the funeral? Like they're too young and you know, but, and he was very adamant they went. Um, with Martin, there was no question. When we brought Martin home, he was in his, wicker coffin in the sitting room they were playing the xbox um you know they ate their breakfast with them the morning they all put things in like he had the heaviest oh. coffin <laughs> i think ever because it was so full of stuff toys and everything um i think it was really important for them they they all spoke at his funeral they all one of them went dressed as batman he thought the hearse was the batmobile he thought it, like he, he actually thought it was the greatest thing yeah at, at that moment yeah um but I, th I think it's, it is important. I think, you know, it's Martin was cremated around the corner in Mount Jerome and, you know, they think daddy's space dust. That's the two little ones. That's what daddy is. Yeah. Um, and that's their way of processing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think while it, it was, obviously it's very hard for them at the moment, I think, I hope when they look back, it'll have, it'll have been an important thing yeah. to do that they were part of it. Um, where, where do you see your role within all of these very complex questions and wonderful service? Um, I think it, for me with psychology it's very much an issue of language. In a way we're moving into a whole new era of awareness around our own personal autonomy. We're in a much more diverse society. We don't have an overarching philosophy. Like in the past we had a philosophy that said you're, you're born and you know you go through a ritual and you go somewhere and we were all very much agreed as to where that somewhere was. Hopefully. It was, hopefully it was yeah. going to be a heaven and not the other place right? Yeah. <laughs> now, now that's all changed enormously I mean you know Venetia is a very good example of, of another generation that's coming up with a very diverse philosophy very different belief systems and in a way having to navigate it but but navigating it on core principles which really are around openness communication you know, acceptance of, he can go in as Batman. It, it's much more diverse, but the underlying things now are all about communication and choice and autonomy and language, finding language for the whole subjective experience of How it. How do you mean language? I, th I think it's, you know, we use words like, like death or dying or things like that, but actually when you talk to patients, they, they, they struggle enormously to find language for their own internal experience. What does it actually mean to them is, is a very different kind of landscape. And I mean, what stands out in my mind is one man who was an engineer that we had who had done lots of meditation with us. And eventually he was very silent about what his experience was like for him. And eventually he said to me, it was like skating on thin ice over a dark hole. Now, it took him six weeks to be able to articulate that that's what it felt like to him. So, so it's very personal what it feels so like So he for was people. scared. Mm. Scared, witless. terrified. Scared witless. And are a know. lot of people scared witless? Oh, I would think so. I, I, I think particularly deaths that happen out of time. Do you know, it's, it's very different to be frail elderly and 86. Well, with all due respect. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to, and to have lived a, to have lived a rich life, to have had the opportunity yeah, yeah, to fulfil yeah. a life, it's very different when you're younger. 
you know, you've just retired maybe, very different experience. Mm -hmm. My grandmother died at 99. And somebody had said to her, you know, when she got to, I don't know, 95, sure, what would you be hanging around for any longer? Haven't you? And she said, when you get to 94, you can answer that <laughs> question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Which I thought was a good yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, when you're talking about diversity and changing, like do we, in the past in Ireland, it was so predominantly Roman Catholic or Anglican to a lesser extent, and maybe a small number of Jewish people. Jewish, yeah. mm. uh, but now it's all very different. Are you dealing with all of the new mm. people coming into Ireland, and is that very different? Yes, obviously it's a much more diverse group. It, it's still a very homogenous white is Catholic it? society. I mean, yeah. it, it still is. Um, it's a long time ago now, but 15 years ago I worked in London, and the diversity there is still light years ahead of where Dublin is at. So we're changing, but we're still, look around this room, we're still a very homogenous group, I think. Yeah, they look terrific, don't they? <laughs> they are, right? <laughs> That's exactly my point. <laughs> so it is changing. I, I suppose even simple things, I mean, on the ward round today, we had two patients where we were using an interpreter to talk to the patient. So as Ursula said, it's so much of this is about communication. And when you add an interpreter, mm -hmm. change the, the language and then what's being and interpreted. And the nuance. Yeah. Those nuances and, and what's mm -hmm. being interpreted. Yeah. And you know, the classic is where you'll I'll maybe ask quite a long question and the person will interpret and it'll be like three words. And I'm thinking, or the corresponding, there'll be a big long answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> So you really need good interpreters yeah. uh, because in so many ways it can get lost, the message can get lost there. Uh, can I come back to um, what we were talking about briefly there and that image of the man skating on yeah. thin ice over a dark hole, I'll never forget that I can tell you, uh, as long as I live. What are people's biggest fears? Is it fear of the afterlife? Is it fear of pain? It's pain. It's pain, it's yeah. definitely pain. So. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. And uh, uh, how contentious is the whole thing about pain control and morphine and all of that? It isn't that contentious. And I mean, usually that's, in the scheme of things, that's something where we can reassure people. There's lots we can do about pain. So in terms of the difficulties that people face, I, I have no problem looking someone in the eye and saying, we can treat your pain, we can help you with this because we almost always can. But it's far and away, that's the biggest fear. It's always pain. Yeah. And, and a, a sort of a more existential fear, perhaps that just isn't expressed to me as the doctor as much, but I think that plays second fiddle. Pain is still the big thing. People expect to have a lot of pain. Right. And they talk about not just pain, but will I have terrible pain? Yeah. There's language like that. Um, and so we're, we're trying to reassure people on that. And, and some people, the reassurance works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but it is far and away, that's the biggest fear, it still is. Uh, and I suppose, I think maybe, I think what, how death or, or dying is portrayed in the media is, is a big part of that. I mean, Tell I mean, me how, yeah. Well, I just think how people die on TV and how they die in real life are not always the same. Yeah. Um, I always say, it's, it's the converse in some ways, but if I, if I ever have a heart attack, I want it to happen live on TV. <laughs> because on TV, people do really well when they're resuscitated. <laughs> so, so the success rate is terrific. So it's the place to be. Um, so I think so much of what we learn is, is from what we see and what we read and so on. Yeah. And perhaps death and dying isn't portrayed very accurately. Sometimes it is. And, and it, that's why it's great when people will come out with a personal story, a true story. When that message is getting out there, that's, that's really helpful. But a lot of the time, how people die in EastEnders is quite different to the real world. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, point taken. Yeah, and then there's a lot of mayhem and murder and, and that too. Yes. You know. Yes. So, um, and how, how do people access here? Do they go to the doctor or do they ring up? Like, how does that system work? Like, to, for somebody to say we're, we're bringing you to the hospice, you think, oh, good night, good luck and goodbye. Yeah, yeah. That's the end of me. Like, uh, how does that go? Well, there's still a lot of people where the, the hospice, they might on the one hand say, God, I've heard very good things about the hospice. I'm never going there. <laughs> uh, so, so there is still that. And I work here. I also work in Tala Hospital. And 
several times a month I'd, I'd have a, a patient who I'm talking to and we can talk very openly about what's going on and I'm saying look look at, at what's going on for you here I think the hospice actually would would really be a good move for you and they can't make that they, they can't make that jump um, it's just too big a step it's it's the acceptance that they're dying and there is also a, a picture out there that, that are an expectation that the hospice will be doom and gloom and we'll all wear dark suits and, and no walk slowly around and no laughing yeah, yeah, yeah that's still very much there yeah. very much there and th there's a movement within palliative care to to rebrand so um, in the UK a lot of so I'm, I'm a palliative care doctor so a lot of palliative care doctors in the UK are now called supportive care doctors I'm not sure what that means but it's not palliative it's not hospice so there's a rebranding exercise underway yes yeah I'm not sure we can rebrand the hospice to be honest yeah. um, but there is that, that fear is, is very real but for people. But I do remember growing up um, when this place was known as the... The Hospice for the Dying. Hospice for the Dying. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you would think, oh my God, we'll go up the other road rather yeah. than go yeah. down that. Yeah. So the rebranding has occurred, I would think, to a certain extent. Yeah, no, there is a change. And, yeah. and I think there's, there's a better understanding. Um, but we spoke about it briefly. I mean, you have an audience like this, very good looking audience, who, who understand what a hospice is, yeah. but it's the people who would never come to a lecture like this. It's about dying and it's in the hospice. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And those are the people that it's we, very hard that you to, need get to. to get to. Yeah. What, what reaction did you get, for example, today? Because I, I often think if you mention the word hospice, they'll go over and switch off the radio and say, listen, I'm having a bad day. Or, do people feel reassured by what you Oh, I, I think people feel reassured. And I, I think it's very important how we talk about the work we do. You know, that we, we, we speak with, with confidence, with ease. You know, that we're, we're comfortable in doing the jobs we do. And I think that comes across as well, uh, Mary. You know, people often ask me, um, is it a certain kind of person that comes to work in the hospice? And in a way, the answer kind of is yes. Like, people often come into this work very idealistic. And then after about six months, we all decide we've every disease we've ever seen, right? Mm. And if you can get through that, then you stay and, and most of the people here are lifers. Most of the people have given long, long years of service and because they can do the work, they can bear it, you know. Right. Yeah. So I think it's about how we how we speak about it as well. Okay. You know? Do any of your uh, people coming to you, do, would you be in and out of the hospice? I would, yeah. No, this is a, a place that I, I have witnessed what goes on here and uh, again, to see the amazing work that some of the some of the guys do here is just it's incredible. They're yeah. amazing people, and uh, I do think it's more of a vocation for people who come into places like this because the energy that they're surrounding themselves in is very palpable, and it's it's hard not to get involved with families who are are grieving because their loved ones sometimes, as you said, they may have a term in front of them where they've been given six months, they've been given a year and it's amazing how their health can deteriorate in that year and the grief that they're suffering, the families while watching their loved ones and to have good people around them, to have supportive people around them, people who understand that, it's just so important. So it's, I, I just, it's an amazing place here, you right. know, and what I witness here is incredible. Yeah, I, I, I know of somebody else who, whose father uh, died here and the family nearly had a conniption at the idea of the dad going into the hospice and by the time he died they were nearly saying can I book my place now you know because because yeah. it had got done so well you do another very interesting thing Mary you have a day in the year where you celebrate um, your Enjoy. husband yeah yes how do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. No, no, but I suppose I babbled away somewhere about it. Yeah, um, on his anniversary, on his. Now it might be exactly the day, but it, I, I book a mass, and it was very good and very religious, and I book a mass in the local church, and I ask all his f family and friends, and we. He never knew a grandchild because my six grandchildren came. It didn't come till after he died. Wow. 
but on my fridge door on the outside, I have the memoriam card. And when the children were young, they used to say, that's our granddad. And they'd point to the photograph. Yeah. But um, so they were aware of him. And then every year when I had the party, as they, the kids began to call it Endless Party, because the cousins from Dublin would be down and they'd have children and the Athlone cousin children, and the friends who would come often had children. So they, it just kind of spontaneously arose. When are we having Endless Party? And I think it's lovely, because he would have liked a party himself. Yeah. Uh, and he didn't have a chance because he went so quickly. So yes, and every February, he died on the last day of January, but every February they know that, that someday that month we will have the party for Ender, right. and the people don't have to go to the Mass, but we go to the Mass. But I often say to people, don't feel you have to go to Mass. And then they come down to the house and I get someone in to do the catering and we have a lovely chat and talk. And we talk about end a little bit, but then we talk about politics, Marion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why so, am um, I not surprised? Yeah, 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 Why am yeah, I not yeah. surprised? Or what did, what did you say on television or <laughs> on radio? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so it's a lovely day. It's a lovely day. And I think, wouldn't that be a nice way to be remembered? By young and old. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, how, how do you handle the conversations with your kids now? Um, well, we talk about Mar it's Martin all the time. I mean, he's yeah, yeah. constantly, you know, um, the kids have his photos everywhere. We talk about him in general conversations. Um, his car is still outside the house. We put Christmas tree lights on the roof rack. Ah, do at you? At Christmas. No, we did. Cause but that's your party. Yeah. yeah no, but yeah. we actually had a party for him on oh, his anniversary. We you did do. a big party. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but when the kids last Christmas was our first Christmas, which obviously was very difficult. Um, but when the kids was very upset one night, the daddy wouldn't know it was Christmas. So, uh, and how would he know looking down? So we put Christmas tree lights all over the roof rack of the car. And so when they came home from school one night, it was dark and the car was oh, covered yeah, in that lights. That was lovely. But they now, the car is now their playhouse. So they use the oh, car right. and all the kids where we live all get in and out the car and they play spies and Excuse me. jump in the roof. And, you know, so that, that keeps him alive. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, he's just, he's very present. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. his stuff is still around. Yeah. There's no, I mean, he will always be talked about. I mean. Uh, can I come back to you on the way society is changing? Because um, in the past, you'd hear people say, oh, sure, maybe it was all for the best. That's right. And uh, yeah. they're in a better place now. Yeah. And while you might, through gritted teeth, say, no, it's not all for the best, but that there was that concept. Yes. Does that still exist? I, I think that's where the big change it does is it. now. Do you yes. know what I mean? I, th yeah. I think it is, exists very strongly among certain generations, you know, the older generations, but then there's a kind of a huge gap now around mm. how the next generation are going to even talk about that. Mm. I mean, I think people don't know what to say. But I think that's, that's half the thing, and that's actually one yeah. of the things um, we've talked a lot about on the podcast, is mm. how you talk to people. people. Because how are you supposed to know? I mean, I think I've said awful things in the past in when people have lost someone because I haven't known what to say but it's only when you're in the situation it really resonates mm. with you like it's at least you're still young she'll meet somebody else or at least you know yeah. he was at home and not in the hospital yeah. and at least you've got the kids or um like I know somebody else who got a chance to say goodbye to their um their dad actually and they were like aren't you lucky you got to say goodbye yeah. you know so it's I think it's the words we use yeah. and I think it's learning how to use those words and also learning how to speak about people yes. that, that have gone. Yes. I mean, there's a, a lot of people who just are terrified to bring up the person's name because they're terrified of upsetting you. Uh, maybe they're terrified of getting upset themselves. But I think the people that are left behind, all they want half the time is to hear the person's name being said, whether they're slagging them off, them whether they're yeah. idolizing, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. You know, it's 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 talking right and listening yeah, yeah. yeah but you well. are right i mean i think one of the worst comments i have heard said to me is he's gone to a better place yeah. in a yeah. better yeah. place yeah. yeah and i said to yeah. one woman but how do you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. he was in a very good place yeah. here yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
And I think it's such an inane remark. Yeah. And the other one I hate, and you, I know priests mean very well when they say it, but they say in the church, maybe, if you were there, about, they say, well, maybe it's Mary and Tom, let's say, and then Tom has died earlier, and now Mary has mm. died. And they say, mm. and remember, Tom is waiting for her. And you know, I have a vision of a kind of a gate, <laughs> and Tom <laughs> is in a shirt and tie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, and I can't envisage it. <laughs> and they used to say to me, Ender will be waiting for you. For well, he's a long time waiting now. <laughs> no, but he is. He's 19 years nearly. <laughs> but um, I, I don't. I think they're inane remarks. Yeah. I really do. Yeah, but and they I are know based people on mean faith. Well. Yeah. 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 yeah, they are based on faith. So how do you do the balance between the two? Yes, mm. there is that. Don't yeah. think about it. That's what I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I really don't. People say, "Oh, you know, are you? Do you think about death?" No, I don't. Yeah. And if I die, I die, and it's all over. Like, yeah. and they'll yeah. be playing the party song. Do you think song. you're going somewhere? Do I think I'm going somewhere? I don't think of it, Mary, and I actually don't. I put it out of my okay. head. Mm. Maybe that's all escapism or something. No, do, I don't. Do, do does the diff Do people's attitudes vary according to whether or not they have faith? Oh, oh, I think so. I mean, I, th I think any strong philosophical belief system offers a, a lot of support. And yeah. it, it doesn't have to be a religious faith. I mean, if you're an environmentalist, that'll offer you a, an equally strong kind of philosophical position. You know, because really? you think then, oh, you get buried in a wicker casket in a bluebell wood and you become part of the earth again. You know, so oh, it depends what, what mm. will capture, capture something for you. I think the dilemma now is we're, we're between faiths in many ways. Do you yes, know what I mean? We're, right. we're in that in between murky kind mm. of territory and it's not a very easy place to be and we've got to be a bit careful about you know acquiring new faiths too rapidly as well do you know because there's a lot of new age belief systems out there as well do you know yeah, yeah. Steve mm. you want to go in I, I think the opposite is also true I think some of the people who struggle most with dying are the people with faith who now are questioning their faith well that's true yeah oh, and yeah. I think they can have a very difficult time with it and and Generalizations are usually not good things, but yeah. I've certainly seen some priests really, really struggle because this is the ultimate moment of truth coming, and sometimes that's very difficult. Now, if your faith remains very strong, I agree entirely. It's it's a uh, huge it's support for you. For you. Yeah. But for many people, they begin to doubt it, and that can be very difficult because right. they're they're angry with themselves for doubting it. Um, so and it makes the life meaningless, perhaps well, also, or. Maybe. Foolish, or I don't know. Maybe they feel they should be. Should be better. They should be better. They, they should be better. braver. They should be yeah. okay because they believe in God, and they don't feel okay, and they're sort of disappointed in themselves and questioning mm. where their belief systems are at. So it, it can go, it can go either way. That yeah. I think. Yeah. Mm. Um, are there again? It's a question just off the top of your head, of percentages of people who have religious funerals, or secular funerals or non-religious funerals? Well, at the moment, predominantly, it is still Roman Catholic and Church of Ireland, but there would be about 20% of the population now would be having non-religious humanist services, where, again, it's just, it's about entirely all about the person and all about bringing out the personality, the person that they were, what they loved, what they stood for, their family. Mm. And again, it's just, so, and, it's it to me it's 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 lovely to see that and again because sometimes i believe in the the roman catholic way of doing things we are all one we are all looked upon the same so it can be quite structured in a way and sometimes the personality is lost there but um no it, it's about 20 percent at the moment but that certainly is increasing and what about um immigrants and people of other religious denominations? Again, Ireland has become a more diverse place in yeah. years and again it will continue to do so but um, a lot of non-nationals would be quite of that humanist faith as well. Um, now again, there's, we've, we've a great Spanish population here, we've a great French population and, and they would be Roman Catholic and uh, the Polish are Roman Catholic, they still go to, there are churches that accommodate them in Dublin City and yeah. uh, again around the country so again the practices are quite similar to how we do things. 
And and say people of the Muslim faith, do they the come Muslim, to you? The Muslim faith is um, it's 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 very different, but again, it happens very quickly. But it's very in terms of the community get really involved in it, and everyone comes together. But it's very different to how the Roman Catholic way of doing things. They don't use coffins. So again, there'd be natural burials and it has to happen within 24 hours. Um, or again, the only ex uh, exception to that is when maybe there is a post-mortem being requested. So that to them is the only exception to that rule. Right. But in, in the majority of times, the community dress, clean, prepare the body and the funeral would happen within 24 hours. Right. So, and w do they operate separately or do you do these? Funerals? No, we do them and we, do them. we would assist them in, in doing that. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's, it, it, there, there are more mosques now in Dublin. There are more, uh, more of a Muslim yeah. community and uh, we're there to provide the service that the families request. And uh, we have learned an awful lot from different communities in, in Ireland. And uh, we embrace change, we embrace kind of evolving ourselves as a business. Because it has happened a long time ago, like it was just quite structured. It was Roman Catholic funerals, Church of Ireland. But in the last 10 years, certainly, we've seen a huge change. Right. And just even within the Roman Catholic, people are bringing more personality into it. Well, um, mind you, does not annoy the church sometimes too. It can, it can upset the church. But then well, actually, when they were talking about bringing up whiskey and cigarettes and vodka, I thought myself it was a little. And that's it, kind of when you give an inch, some some people take a mile, you know. And uh, again, I think as well as that, the mass itself can be quite sacred, and a priest really can be the only one in the room that really understands that. And he's yeah. trying to protect the sacrament of Mass. Yeah. Um, there are opportunities before the Mass starts and maybe after the Mass is finished where they will allow a particular song or some personal momentums to be brought up and spoken about. And then again, when you get to the cemetery or the crematorium, they allow more of the person's personality come out in that, in that venue. Um, right. Because again, they're just trying to protect what they believe and what they have been taught. So yeah. it is a bit of just lack of knowledge and uh, maybe a lack of want to know what's the right thing to do, right. you know? Yeah. Um, now, I know that we're talking, as it were, in front of an audience that's very experienced on this. And you were saying to me earlier on, it's the audience that's not here uh, that you kind of want to engage with. What do you want them to know about this? Oh, um, I suppose I, I'm very much a proponent of people knowing what's going on and, and being able to make decisions. So I, I suppose my bias is towards people being able to talk about what's going on, and others have, have said this as well. So there's people where that is just a difficult conversation, and, and that inability or difficulty talking about things is very much then facilitated by the healthcare structure. So the doctor is generally speaking, and I'm allowed to criticize doctors, yeah. <laughs> you know, the doctor is generally quite happy. The patient didn't ask any questions. I don't need to tell them anything. Mm -hmm. So you have this sort of folly I do where the, where the patient isn't asking because the doctor would tell me if I needed to know, and the doctor isn't saying because the patient isn't asking. And then you have this weird situation that ar arises. And that weird situation can lead to very wrong treatments and people going down roads that absolutely wasn't the road they wanted to go down. Like what? Well, the very dramatic situations are people who end up having treatments that they did not want or perhaps being kept alive in a situation where in no sense did they want to be kept alive like this, but they were never able to talk about it and the presumption is then, well, it's easier to keep going. Now that's not a common thing that happens, but it does happen and it's very tragic when it happens. And sometimes the family don't feel empowered to speak up and say, actually, John would never have wanted this. Yeah. That they just feel, I can't do that. It, it, I'd be letting John down. I have, to, I have to represent him by keeping fighting. Whereas actually if John had said to them, do you know, if something happened, let me be if something happens. Yeah. That takes the weight off the yeah, family. I, I was talking about that because we, we did one such well recently that we would, for each other, this is husband and wife, say yeah. no. But the solicitor pointed out to us that it doesn't carry any weight in law, 
but it can yeah. carry kind of emotional weight at a difficult time? I would say it carries huge weight. So at the moment, so that's an advanced care directive or a living will, and at the moment those aren't legally recognised. No. So it has no legal standing whatsoever. Having said that, I've never yet seen an advanced care directive overlooked or disregarded. They're given huge weight, absolutely huge weight. So when you actually come into the health system with that, it's given a lot of weight. It's not given any weight when you store it under your mattress um, or you give it to somebody else who lives in New Zealand and doesn't give it to anyone in Ireland. So it's not foolproof. So I don't have a, a written advanced care directive. I think a lot of times better than that is having one or two people in your family who know what you want. They know that, you're, that they are your spokesperson and they have an overview of the sort of thing that's right for you. Right. Because even if you go to write it down, it's a very hard document to write. It's very a, you get a solicitor to do it. <laughs> well, and, and there are some good versions going yeah. around. There are, but it's, even those are, are difficult. They, they'll very often still need interpreting. So mm. who's the person who's going to interpret? And, and the classic where it goes wrong is perhaps you have one person, maybe their partner has died before, they have three children, and one is the one who lives with mum, one is the only daughter, and one is the eldest and all three are the contact person. Mm. And maybe yeah. they don't see things the same. And what happens then? Right. It's very yeah. difficult. It yeah. is very difficult. Yeah. But the, a friend was up the, in the house the other night and her husband died about six weeks ago. And she was going through what had happened in the hospital. And she said she could see him vanishing in front of her eyes. And he was being peg fed mm. and he hated it. Mm. And she, kept on saying to them, you know, you have to take into account that he really makes, gives, caused him pain, caused him suffering, and he was going to die anyway. So this was never said in front of Gabe, mm. that he was going to die anyway. And the doctors would, when she was gone out, the doctors would go back into him and persuade him and say this was good for him and all of that. Mm. So, until she was such a woman, she said, I, d I don't know how to put that thing in, but I've been watching and I know how to take it out and I'll pull the bloody thing out yeah. if you don't do it. Yeah. And it was only a day and a half before he died that the palliative team came in. Mm. Now, how does that happen? If you're in the general hospital yeah. system and you're busy people who are all trying to make people well and better and give them treatment, but there's the kind of the doctor knows best attitude. Mm. Um, so how do you reach out and say, no, I want, a, I want palliative care? In, because what Kathleen was saying is they wouldn't listen to her. And that's inexcusable. I, I mean, yes. that's just so wrong. I'm so glad you said that. It's, um, mm. it's totally wrong, but it, it does happen. And mm. um, they just, it should never happen, something mm. like that. And I do think that's, I would think that's rare. But it does happen. And, and have I seen things go badly wrong like that? Yes. And, and in the same way that there's plenty of people who aren't comfortable about death and dying, there's plenty of nurses and doctors who aren't comfortable with death and dying. Yeah. And their way to deal with it is, is just it isn't happening. And I. So if you're within the system, like, first of all, you haven't got enough medical knowledge to know yeah. is the person dying, isn't the person dying, is there a chance of recovery? So at what stage or how do you proceed in the next way to say, because the doctor doesn't want to tell you, because it's a failure, I always take the view, it's a failure for a doctor not to be able to keep you alive. Mm. So how, like when we were doing the hospice friendly hospitals, it was quite difficult to get that communication going yeah. whereby it would automatically be considered. And it's, it has got better. And, and even in the, well, I suppose 20 years, I, I have seen that get better. But we still get it wrong. Absolutely, we still get it wrong. And the weight can fall on the family that to put their hand up, put their hand up very high and keep it in the air and keep saying, this isn't good enough, this isn't right, and, and speaking. But it's, it's, it can be very hard very to keep difficult. doing that. Because yeah. you don't want somebody not to recover if they could recover. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think. It is, uh, unfortunately, sometimes it is, it's to the family to advocate, and it shouldn't be. I mean, the, the healthcare professionals should be coming forward and saying, look, this is where things are at, and 
you know, here are our options, and they should be talking about that, but it, it doesn't always happen. And how do you change that? Very slowly. And um, I hate to say it, but if you look at some of the big changes that have help, happened in the healthcare structure, it's when things went horribly wrong and it reached the front of the news and the front of the papers and somebody got in trouble. Sometimes big changes happen after things like that. Mm -hmm. Now it would be terrible if that was what it took. Sometimes but it is. The other thing that happens is yeah. change comes from the margins. It, it's going to be this generation that will collectively fight for change. So change sometimes happens by popular support. You know, if we look at the changes we've had in some of the laws in Ireland, you know, in terms of gender issues and things yeah. like that, that, you know, changes that we thought wouldn't happen for another 20 years mm. suddenly kind of happen. And I think that's what's going to happen around these issues is that as people's voices about their own experience get stronger, for some reason, that patient in himself wasn't able to hold his voice in that no, moment. No, he wasn't. You no. see, exactly. So, but you and know, he didn't want to be impolite. And he didn't want to be difficult, and he didn't want to be impolite. But you know, people are getting more assertive. They're holding their voices better. They're getting less afraid of authority, and they're going to start holding their voices more strongly in those mm -hmm. situations. You know, because we we have to understand about auton autonomy. It's okay for people to make different choices, choices we don't think are necessarily good or foolish choices because it's their right to make the choice, mm. you know? It's the right to but make that decision. But, but in certain areas, if you go certain far, again, you're going against the law. Well, that's a whole other step. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. cause we all live in a civil society by virtue of the laws we agree yeah. on. So we all have to kind of work within that. Right. You know, work within yeah. And, and on the whole business of do not resuscitate, is that accepted now? I think it's got better, Stephen. Is it? it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, that's, that, that's, that's not over. contentious. There's no legal yeah. issues around that. Yeah. So that's, and yeah. I, we tried to change the wording. So it used to be do not resuscitate, which meant don't try CPR. But we now try and talk not about DNR, but about DNAR, which is much more realistic. Do not attempt resuscitation. Because oh. the, the perception is out there that resuscitation works. <coughs> And usually it doesn't work. So, uh, you know, part of the understanding is even changing the language. Right. Do not attempt yeah. resuscitation is an improvement on DNR. Mm -hmm. But that's entirely, entirely accepted as right. a reasonable but thing. The, yeah. If you take that every survey I've ever read or heard about said most people would prefer to die at home. Mm. And yet the system doesn't facilitate that at all. I. Ish. I Sorry, I shouldn't say at all. Yeah. Ish. I'd have a hesitation about that because okay. th those surveys are, are generally done people in, the, in their health. And I think what people want when they're ill can change. Now, there's still very many people who want to die at home and it's the right thing for them. But there's quite a large group of people who, as they become yeah. ill, their wishes change. Yeah. So um, I think that percentage, there's big numbers quoted like 80% of people want to die at home. That wouldn't be what I see when people are ill. Right. Now, but it's still, for, for a large number of people, it's right. But for quite a large number of people, actually, no, they, they want the, the, the nursing, medical, that sort of stuff be for looked security. after by professionals. Yeah. And let their wife or their husband or their son or the daughter, let them be the wife or the husband, the son or the daughter, not the nurse. Right. So I think both camps are, are possibly quite evenly matched in numbers. Right. I was really thinking in terms of home care, we were talking about it mm -hmm. uh, earlier on, because it's, it's a wonderful service in, in, yeah. in my view. Um, and yet I understand that even with the best of home care from the hospice, that people might get just nervous. Well, uh, yes. Um, again, so I suppose most of the people who come under the, the services of the hospice, most, the majority will die at home. Okay, so it's a minority who die in the hospice. Oh, right. Yeah, we have more oh, patients. Oh, I didn't know that. No, we have more patients die at home than, than in the hospice. But you can have somebody who wants to be at home and everything is set up and the family are behind them and everyone's very clear and everybody's doing everything right, but sometimes things just happen in the middle of the night and mm -hmm. suddenly a situation isn't tenable at home. Yeah. And the hospital is the place to go. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. But sometimes also people, people change their mind. And you can have somebody who said, I want to be at home, I want to be at home, I want to be at home, I don't want to be at home. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's where we're always trying to facilitate that. We're trying, if we need to get somebody in today, 
we're always trying to bring that person in today. Mm. So if you go to Tallar, James's or Beaumont, they'll be 100% full all the time. We always try and have a bed or two free for that person who at the last minute, actually, my wish is to, be at ho is to not be at home now. That's very um, interesting, yeah. But for those who want to be at home, if they want to be at home, they need a family, they, they need support. Yeah. Um, but if they have that, most of those people will be at home. Because you hear yeah. discussed on the radio now, you know, about home care packages and all that. Yeah. That doesn't do it. It's not going to be enough. So a home care package is, is the, you know, the community support provided by the state and you'll get up to a maximum of maybe three or four hours a day is considered a, is, is a very large home care package. Oh. So that still leaves 20 plus hours a day. Yeah. So if you're on your own and you don't have family to support you, it's very difficult to die right. at home. Yeah. 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 I saw you nodding there when he was talking about that. Well, I just think as, as well as that, Marion, a lot of people at home, they're not equipped to deal with situations. They're not nurses, they're not doctors. So again, my own mother-in-law passed away there just over two and a half years ago from, um, from cancer. And she had had home care. Um, but again, her final wish was to end up in, in the hospice in uh, Drada because she knew the level of care that was going to be there 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And the, the level of stress that that would put on her husband and her daughter, because they're not equipped um, when a problem may arise. They're yeah. even be quite anxious around how much morphine do I give? You know, mum might be asking for more morphine, her pain might be increasing. Am I doing the right thing? And it's all that uncertainty. You need, you need, very, you need confident people around you. You need people who are equipped to deal with any situation that may arise because yeah. it's all so unpredictable and it can change every moment and yeah. I think it's just my own preference would to be end up in a place that is fully equipped to deal with any scenario that may would arise it? personally it? Yeah. personally that's right how many people here would prefer a home or a hospital to die or a hospice. But you said a hospital. Well, it was it was it was Drogheda Hospital, but they have a hospice oh, kind right. of section yeah. within the hospital. Mm -hmm. Just so. home, hands up. Who'd prefer home? Hmm. And who would prefer the certainty of professional care in a hospital? <laughs> no, I said hospital. <laughs> <laughs> At a hospital? One, two, three. And this gentleman here, four. Mm, there yeah. you go. <laughs> That's really interesting. But in a hospice, who would. would they oh, would. look at that. <laughs> That's. <laughs> pardon? Yeah. What did she yeah. say? If one had a terminal Illness, uh, yeah. diagnosis, mm. uh, then she'd prefer to be in a hospice, oh, yeah. but other than that, she'd prefer yeah. to be at home. Mm. I think there's a lot of people who want to live at home but die in somewhere else. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's very yeah. good. Um, that's a very interesting one. Yeah. And then how do you choose your timing? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that's why our, our home care yeah. nurses are all clairvoyant. <laughs> they, they can all see into the future. Well, I remember yeah. when my friend Nulo Fuelon was dying, she was getting care at home and she was moved into Black Rock. Just, I don't, don't even know if she was fully there 24 hours. Mm. And you did that wonderful radio interview mm, with right. her. Yeah. Oh yeah, that. And she was so calm about that. She wasn't one bit calm about it. <laughs> she really wasn't. She was very angry and yeah. very bleak yeah. oh, and was very, very bleak. hopeless. Yeah. yeah. Now, she came around a bit, Yeah. yeah. Uh, but she was just in despair. Mm. She really was. A very dark interview, wasn't it? And yeah. did she talk yeah. of afterwards? No, she didn't. No. No, I don't, yeah. Mm. I think, I can't remember. Yeah. No, no, I don't think she did. Um, but she then decided, anyway, how she, typical, when she organised her own funeral, I can tell you, oh, she had the notice for the paper done, <laughs> <laughs> the music chosen, the yeah. old nine yards. 
Um, and she did a lot of travelling mm -hmm. until she just, it was just, mm. uh, couldn't be done, you know. But uh, I think it's interesting that just, even with the home care, and she trusted that home care nurse 100%, mm. it was decided on just the night before mm. that they would move her into. And, and I suppose not, not to overstate it, that there are lots of people who do want to die at home. But yeah. the idea that it's the large majority, I suppose that's what I'm, I don't think it's the case. You don't yeah. think it's the case? No, no. I don't. Yeah. Uh, have you made a living, Will? I, I have. My family are sick hearing me saying what <laughs> they'd, be, they'd be pretty clear. And I, I obviously don't trust any particular member of my family. They all know. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else here? I've made my will, yes. Your will? Yes, yeah. my will. Uh, but, but the one about do not... No, it just I had a solicitor, oh, right. and I said, I, I want to make my will. And he said, fine, and what do you want to do? And I told him, yeah. But that's a real will, not a... Right, not <laughs> living what will. What you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Anybody, how many here have a living will? I've made a will, yeah. No, a living will. Oh, living will, yeah, yeah. And did you tell them? Oh, yes. she's already. <laughs> <laughs> she is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And who was to take her dog? And she didn't trust her sons with her dog. <laughs> and she dotted the I's and she crossed the T's. And she made it easy for me as the executor of a will, but also her assistant decision maker. And when three days before she died, she went into Blackwell Hospice, she said to me, bring the shoebox. And I said, what's in the shoebox? The living will is in the shoebox. Get the shoebox. And before she even went into her room, she presented her living will to the staff in the hospice who accepted it and acted upon it exactly <coughs> as she knew they would. And I think the hospice should have, I think, a head day. And I think it might I be think this might be it. Stephen mentioned who we meet in Tara who think, oh my God, not the hospice. If they could see what those of us have experienced, as far as I'm concerned, the staff in the hospice are angels on this earth. I have a row of angels here at my right shoulder. They know who they are. They know what they did. And I think, I think a head day would not be a bad idea. And just want to make one more comment. From a professional point of view, as a member of the medical profession, I'm aware of the fact that there are many particularly surgeons who deal with patients who are coming towards the end of their life and who are having more and more heroic surgery. And there's absolutely no doubt, Marion, what you said happens. Doctors hate to see their patients die. They hate to lose control. And it's not something that's taught in medical school or anywhere along the line. It's okay to say, I'm sorry, I can't do any more for you. And I think my colleagues in the palliative care team or whatever we're going to call you in the future, Stephen. I think they should come because I think they could help you. And I think they're calling far too late, far, far too late. People's families go through hell, patients go through hell, multiple surgical procedures, peg tubes, intravenous feeding, and the poor family are caught on this treadmill of utter trauma with no good end in sight. And I think somewhere along the line, the only thing that will change this is education, education, education. And I think that starts in medical school. And I think when the trainees go on their training rotation to be top class surgeons or whatever they're going to be top class at, it should be drilled into them again. It's okay to say enough is enough. You don't consider it as failure. Consider it failure if you don't tell the patient that they have options which include wonderful palliative care. 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Yeah. I was going to ask you, in, it, it's just an ordinary medical school, if you know somebody going through uh, to become a medic. Does it come up as a semester or a... So we have Trinity College and University College are both linked with here. So the Trinity right. students, half of the students who go through Trinity Medical School will spend two weeks here on the wards. And I think that's, I think that, that is the future. Half of them don't, it's just the look of the draw, half do, half don't. Mm -hmm. And UCD used to come here for two weeks and then it got cut out of their syllabus so they now, they now come for a three hour afternoon instead, that's it. <laughs> so, um, so it's, we're winning, we're losing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Marion, the literature on communication training shows that um, junior medics are, are better at communicating yeah. what, before they enter medical school than when they come out. Yeah. They're better yeah. communicators yeah. at the beginning. They better write. Probably. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, I mean, it's uh, just... Why is that? You, you know these things. Why is that? <laughs> well, it, it's just the rigour of their training. I mean, they're, they're, they're trained very, very rigorously in evidence-based medicine. And, and in that the person gets lost, and also the cultural bits get lost. You know, the reading English literature or history. It, it all gets stripped out because they're too, they're too busy. It's a huge curriculum and it's very intense life basically yeah just hard on them that is yeah. extraordinary yeah. Uh, w w I, d I don't know to what extent you would be dealing with the family say after the shock of the death and the shock of the funeral and th three days later saying what happened there which is kind of the experience that both of you mm. had do you ever hear complaints about people saying the doctors wouldn't listen to him or the doctors wouldn't listen to her you, yes, you, you, I suppose people hear all different things themselves and they sometimes hear what they want to hear but sometimes they also hear what they don't want to hear if you understand me. Um, there's a lot of emotions that happen and, and people unfortunately they're relying so much nearly 100% on the, the support that they have around them being doctors and sometimes they don't want to, they don't physically hear what maybe they should have heard and they, they choose to ignore that. So again, it, it, in the days and weeks that kind of follow, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of unanswered questions, and again, they do yeah. seek that. There's a lot of confusion. What have I just come through here? What, yeah. what happened, Mum? What happened, Dad? Why did yeah. she or he yeah. de deteriorate so yeah. quick? But yeah. a lot of it is mindset. It's yeah. all about acceptance. It's, you know, it's, it's really down to the individual. So. Um, yeah, you that's do. so important, that the way you put it like that, in the days immediately or following on days and weeks when somebody dies, I mean, huge despair can come over you. I remember coming in the week after Enda died, coming home from Dublin and putting the key in the door and going in and putting down my case and the whole house was silent. Mm -hmm. Marion, I just thought, what am I going to do with my life? I really did, and I remember thinking, there's a song goes, is that all there is to life? You yeah, know that one? Yeah. I actually said that out loud in the house. And I said, I, I, there's no reason for me to live anymore. I just, it's utter despair. D did you have that? Yeah, but I think more, it, so now I'm in the second year because I think in the first year you're caught in this, it's almost like a bubble yeah, and yeah, you're, you're yeah. carried along and all your friends are making sure you don't have any weekend by yourself, any mm -hmm. milestone by yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of, I think it took me to the end of the first year not to expect Martin to walk through the door. Yeah. I always had the thing that one, just, which was ridiculous, but yes, at the same yeah. thing it was, thing. and I think now it's reality. Yeah, He's yeah. done his birthday before, we've done, the kids' birthday, so it isn't this time last year yeah. anymore. And I think that uh, that actually often gets left out, and I think it should be spoken about more as well, because the amount of people that have said to me, oh, well, we didn't want to tell you, but the second year is harder than the first year. And I wish they had, because then I could have been Ready more for prepared it. for yeah, it yeah, than yeah, yeah. perhaps. Um, and that I have been. experience that um, Mary has described mm. about coming home, putting the key in the door, yeah. and the silence. Now, presumably you didn't really have the silence because you had the kids. Well, I was off work when the kids went back to school about a week later. 
Um, and I remember one day going home and Martin used to work at home as well, so he used to sit at the end of the kitchen table in the chair. And I remember just walking in the door and there's nobody. Yeah, and terrible it, feeling. You know, and it just was like, oh, and yeah. I kept, I remember making myself a coffee in, uh, by the kitchen, by the sink, and I kept turning around and looking at his chair and going mm. like, where are you? Do you know what I mean? And it is, it's a, it's a very eerie, and the, lonely, it's, yeah, feel, but it's, it's, it's a loneliness. It's the acuteness yeah. of it, the absolute, absolute realisation, mm. he is gone, yeah. he's gone and I'm alone. Now, I, like you, I had two children, two sons, but they were all away doing things, you know, the mm. way boys are. And I just thought, he's gone. That's a very he's... sexist <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> no, it's true. No, it's true. No, it's true. <laughs> but, um, but you're forgiven. <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, but uh, I did what I think. I went round all the house mm. and I put on the radio in the bedroom, mm. the radio in the living room, the radio in a little office, and suddenly there were voices and mm. music and life. Yeah. And I said, well, this is it. Yeah, yeah. you've got to get it. But it takes it. a while, I think. It does take you a know, while. And I think oh, yeah. it's sort of also, you have certain times of the week. Yeah, um, yeah. And it doesn't, the weekends it, it doesn't get any mm. easier. No, it doesn't. It gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks a million. <laughs> No, no, yeah. it's the truth. No, but it is. It's it true. Is, it's it like, is, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is. Right. How do you help people with bereavement? Well, we have um, we have a bereavement service and we have a social work team that work in the bereavement service as well. And so anybody who's been in our service has the option of coming back for bereavement counselling. And also there's do a they? children's group. Oh, we do. Yeah, we've quite, um, uh, quite a large number of people will contact us afterwards. Um, and there's a children's group as well that's run every year. But I mean, there's, you know, there's, it's a life-changing, altering mm. event. Yeah. You become a different person mm. afterwards. You know, th there's no kind of fixing it in a sense. What you could do with bereavement counselling is help people not get stuck in cul-de-sacs. You know, not get frozen in time, not get terribly depressed. You can help keep mm. them on the road, but it's not an easy road. Yeah. And is yeah. it get yourself occupations and do things? And no. To be honest with you, mostly the dilemma with people is either having, having thoughts that they feel they can't share with other people. So, you know, if somebody's had a long chronic illness, it's not unusual for a spouse to have a thought of, I wish they were gone, I wish they were free of suffering. Yet that's, that's a very difficult th thought to share with your neighbor. Yeah. Um, so it's often confusing thoughts or, or blocked affect, you know, where people have been brought up in a way where they don't easily cry, they don't easily feel angry, and so they get kind of emotional indigestion, so they get very frozen in themselves. So they're the, they're the big things we watch out for. Right. You know? yeah. and, and in the anticipation of bereavement, do they talk to you or you, the, the family now, that this is not the, the person who is dying, but the person who will be bereaved? No. Not to me. Not to you. They would talk to Ursula. Mm. <laughs> or I think, or one of the social workers, or indeed the carer or the nurse mm. who's in the room spending much more time with them than I would be. That's, That's right. who they well, talk I, to. Well, I have to say, I think carers who are, as I would say, at the bottom of the food chain in yeah. terms of status are often the most yeah. humane and yeah. lovely uh, people in the in the whole hospital. And, and we have, just on the wards in the hospitals, we have a lot of uh, care assistants who've been with us a long time. And just they're so cheery and skilled and empathic and they're just the right people for the job. Mm. And that's, that's, what, that's what comes out. It's the simple things, it's that they can have that conversation. Maybe it's when somebody's having a bath and just there's somebody helping them having a bath and it's that chat at that time. Yeah. Um, so it's having people around you who can facilitate just like talking. Like not formally. No, so, yeah. no, and, and, and people sometimes feel, is it time to have counselling? Well, Ursula knows what much more about this. That? I sometimes get irritated when people say there's counselling for every bloody thing. If you stub your toe on the door, you go for counselling, you know? <laughs> and I, I mean, what about, I'm sorry to sound like whatever, hard-hearted Hannah, but there's resilience. Yeah. There is resilience, yeah. You know, yeah. and there is terrible things happen. And they happened. Yeah. 
and people survive them and people get on. I, I think though it's also part of changing society that we were talking about at the beginning because the, the network of support that people would normally have had, which would have been mothers at home, aunts, uncles, neighbours, people down the road, that's got very frayed um, at the moment. And in many ways with the church retreating as well. Yeah. I mean, when I came out in psychology, I was qualified a long time ago, 1976. We were told we had no jobs, basically. There were no jobs because it was a new profession in Ireland because in many ways the church was doing all the counselling at that point. Yeah. And now you can't employ enough psychologists because as one group retreat, another group have moved in. So psychology in many ways has taken on that role yeah. of being the listening ear. But, you know, I think maybe we'll find in another 50 years we don't do so much counselling because people will have different networks, mm -hmm. social networking, blogging, relying on friends. That's going to take off, right. you know. So right. I think it's just changing times. I've got my nod here to right. say our time uh, is up. Listen, thank you all very much. That was really, really, really interesting and informative. And you, I hope, are going to sum up. So thanks so much to everyone for participating this evening. Um, I will go to our panel, but I think the audience became panellists during the evening, which is great to hear your insights. Um, it was unanticipated, but greatly appreciated. Um, so look, I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Um, it certainly was very enlightening and all, all darkness. I think I laughed and I cried during it. Uh, so I thank you for that. So I suppose firstly, thanks to Marion for moderating the discussion so well, so sensitively and keeping the flow of the conversation. I know it's not easy to do. And again, I stress at the end of a long day, so generous to give her time and has always been a friend to the hospice and does Thank anything you. that we ask her to do. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, to Mary, I've been a super fan and in awe of you for a long time, so it was really a delight to see you this evening and to be in your presence. And so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. <laughs> to Benicia, we only met this evening and I really appreciate you being so generous with your time for sharing your experience because I know it's quite raw, but it was really brilliant for all of us to hear how you've handled the situation. Very informative. And I'm in awe of you for doing so, so thank you. <laughs> to Robert, our eternal supporter, he's back again uh, to do this and he comes back by popular demand. I think he gave his great insights to the humanity that he brings and that it's far beyond a business. Um, and I know I felt comforted by the fact of, you know, your approach and what Massey's do as a company. So thank you again for coming back to you on us this evening. <laughs> To my colleagues, Ursula and Stephen, um, thanks so much for your invaluable contributions, both personally and professionally. Um, I feel privileged to work alongside them um, because it's not easy when you're working in an organisation as this to come up and put yourself out there of an evening and, you know, bring your personal to the stage. So I think you should all take a bow for what you've done. Um, Ursula has been involved in the discussion over the last three years and she probably thinks she's off the hook, but we know <laughs> where you are and we'll certainly want you back on the next important topic that we're running next year. But well, I think you'll agree with me, they should all take a bow because it's been really yeah. informative and you've really given so much to us all this evening. So and then back to you all, I hope we've given something back to all our supporters, all our staff and all the volunteers who support us throughout the year. Um, I think that's one event that we're not asking anything of you, that you can just sit and listen and that we're not shaking buckets or not doing anything like that. So thanks again for coming to support us and have a safe journey home and please come back and support it again next year. Thank you. Thanks so much.